I've made a couple of videos on World War II German tanks recently, with their main points being their positives, negatives, and how polarized opinions are on them. Some of you guys were asking if I could do one on the M4 Sherman, since it's often compared to the Tiger and Panther. Yeah, I can definitely do that. I'm pretty familiar with the Sherman, and it was actually the tank that inspired this series. It was the first tank where I noticed how intense opinions could be. Before we jump into the Sherman's history, I want to talk about my sponsor, Apex Gaming, a company that makes pre-built gaming PCs. If you're looking to upgrade, you should definitely check them out. Link is in the description and comments. Now let's get back to the video. Like a lot of things that were created during World War II, the Sherman's origins can be traced to the invasion of France. Germany's overwhelming and incredibly effective use of tanks caught everyone by surprise. No one expected France to fall so quickly. This panicked the rest of the Allies. The US Army realized that the medium tank they were currently using, the M2, was incredibly outdated and outmatched. It was more of a walking machine gun nest than a tank. In particular, the 37mm can was deemed inadequate for future armor threats. It was believed that to take care of these threats, a medium velocity 75mm gun would be needed. However, it would take time to develop a turret capable of housing such a gun, so they designed a stopgap tank. This would have the gun in the hole. Though the 75 was more than enough for both anti-personnel and anti-tank duties, the 37mm was retained. This new vehicle was classified as the M3 medium, and was largely based on the M2. In addition to being a stopgap, the M3 was also used to improve components that would be used on the next medium tank. It was found that the M2 suspension was not up to snuff for the M3, so soon after production started, a beefier system was installed. The side escape hatches were also ballistic weak spots, and the commander's machine gun cupola dramatically increased the vehicle's height. Both of these were originally on the T6, the prototype for the actual next generation medium tank, but were removed when the vehicle was approved for production. In October of 1941, it was designated the M4 medium tank, and was a massive improvement over the M3. Armor was thickened and no longer riveted, the crew was reduced from 7 to 5, and the largely obsolete 37 was removed. The gun was fitted with a gyro stabilizer, like on the M3. The stabilizer didn't allow for true fire on the move capability, but it did help the M4 engage targets quickly. In addition to the cast hole version, a welded hole version was put into production as well. These were the M4A1 and M4 respectively. The first nation to use the M4 in combat was the UK. Their armored force had been decimated at Dunkirk, so they desperately needed replacement vehicles. They used the M4 to great effect in the African theater, where they had a decent amount of experience. They held the M4 in very high regard, with some calling it the best tank on the battlefield. The M4 certainly wasn't without issues though. The radial engine was a source of some trouble. It wasn't incredibly reliable, and had to be treated delicately by the driver. If the driver accelerated too quickly, the engine could blow a cylinder. Apparently, the radial was only really an issue during the African campaign, as it was noted to perform well during Italy. The turret also lacked a hatch for the loader, so it took the loader much longer to escape the vehicle once hit. This certainly led to some avoidable crew deaths, and wasn't fixed until much later in the war. The gyro stabilizer theoretically worked up to 15 miles per hour, or 24 kilometers per hour. But there were some very mixed opinions about it. Some units didn't use it. Others actually used it to engage targets on the move. Regardless, the whole thing was so hush-hush that many tankers were never properly trained on how to maintain it. So it was considered unreliable, despite being the opposite. Eventually, crews were taught how to maintain it. There's this very common idea about the M4 catching fire way too easily, mostly thanks to the gasoline engine. This actually isn't true. In fact, German tanks also use gasoline. The crux of the issue is sponsored ammunition stowage, where rounds were kept in the side above the tracks. Most center mass shots to the M4 side would detonate the ammo. What's not usually mentioned is that German tanks always use this style of stowage. So why do M4s have the reputation while German tanks don't? Well, they kinda do. In the European theater, Panzer IVs were notorious for their catastrophic ammunition explosions. Some people think it's because German tanks had armored ammunition racks, but the M4 also did. The only unprotected ammo is part of the ready rack, but that's the case on most tanks as well. For American units, they reported burn rates in the ballpark of 60%. This compares favorably with German tanks at the time, yet British crews reported around 83%. Still not that far off, but why is it higher? It's believed that British crews heavily overstocked on ammunition, drastically increasing the chance of an ammunition fire. Some crews would also leave rounds unprotected on the floor of the turret. Regardless, wet ammunition racks were soon developed for M4s. These moved the ammo to the whole floor, and had a water glycol filled jacket. When the ammo bin was pierced, the water mixture would theoretically flood the compartment, and put out any fires. They did drastically reduce burn rates, to the point of 10 to 15%, but it probably wasn't because of the water. It was mostly because the ammo was moved to the floor. In Soviet tests, the water didn't really do much. Its biggest impact was slowing down fragments, not actually putting out fires. There's one deficiency that's really talked about, and that is the tracks on early M4s. Not about the high ground pressure, but how they like to throw themselves. This was especially prevalent in the Italian theater, where terrain was often hilly and mountainous. Rubber tracks also led to flipping on icy roads, mainly in Soviet service. This was fixed with steel tracks. As far as armor is concerned, before Normandy crews were happy with it. They said if more armor was going to hamper mobility and reliability, which it invariably would have, then they didn't want it. The short 75 was perfectly fine for most engagements, as tanks only made up less than 20% of targets the M4s engaged. It wasn't adequate for anti-tank use in the European theater, so it was good that an upgunned M4 had already been developed. 
It wasn't fortunate they were kept in England for the invasion, and the HVAP ammo hadn't been developed just in case. In summary, M4s weren't useless paper tigers for German tanks to chew up, but they weren't nearly as perfect as some would believe. It was good for Lend-Lease, but it shouldn't have been the main tank for everybody. Yes, some people actually believe it should have been. It was a very effective medium tank, and could easily fit a variety of roles. It did what it was designed to do. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you on the next one.